of the program today is going to be hearing from a handful of students who went to school here before it closed in 1962. But before we get to that, I just wanted to give a very brief overview, a little context about the building and schools in Millbrook, and then we'll hear from former students. Um, for those of you who were at uh, earlier programs, and when we were at the Quaker Meeting House a few weeks ago, we talked about the Nine Partners Boarding School, right, which no longer exists, but was next door to the Quaker Meeting House. And so that goes all the way back to 1796, when it first opened. And it stayed in operation until 1863. What's fascinating to me about that, that space and this space is that this building operated as a school for almost exactly the same span of years, precisely 100 years later. So the Nine Partner School, 1796 to 1863, this operated as a school from 1896 to 1962, so one year shy of kind of exactly the same run as a school for our community. 61. 61, yeah. So by the time the Nine Partners School closed in 1863, there were one-room schoolhouses all throughout the town of Washington. Anybody want to venture a guess? In the middle of the 19th century, how many different one-room schoolhouses there were just in the town of Washington, right, which has the same borders as it does today? Five. Five? Seven. Yeah, I and mean, I think Allison was on it there. Thirteen, although there are some that kind of overlapped a little bit with neighboring communities where they had a shared space. So just kind of picture that. In the town of Washington, 13 one-room schoolhouses. There were a couple up on the Shunpike. There was one right where the mechanic is on 44, Harry's Garage. Um, there's one on Shady Dell Road. There's one um, kind of on Bang All Road, one in Lithgow. I mean, pretty much every mile or two because you wouldn't walk more than a mile or two to school and that was the only way to get there. I'm not sure how many of those 13 one-room schoolhouses are still standing. I don't think it's many of them. I have a feeling, although I'm not 100% sure of this, that the one on Route 44, you know where Bangall Road uh, intersects, so just shy of Mabbitsville, um, I think that's still there, kind of on someone's property. You can kind of recognize it painted red. Yeah, so you can get a sense of what they would have would have looked like back then. So those schools would tended to provide kind of education up through more or less eighth grade. One teacher, right? students of all different ages, kind of gathered together. By the time we get to the 1890s, which is when this building is from. We're starting to see nationwide a movement towards public high schools. We're not necessarily pioneers in this community, but we're probably in the vanguard. You know, in the 1890s, somewhere between 5 and 10% of American teenagers went to school, right? So most right, teenagers in the country were not regularly attending school at that time. So there were high schools around. But most small communities like this would not have had a school like this in the 1890s. And where places like this existed, it was largely through local initiative. And that's exactly the story of this building. Right? Prominent members of the community, the Thorne family, decided that the community could use a school like this. And so they donated money to have this built and dedicated it to their parents. When this opened, it was not just a school for people who lived in the village. People came from farther afield. Um, they came from neighboring towns, you know, beyond the town of Washington, from Stanford you know, to the north, for example. Um, and I think Marion might talk about this a little bit later, but to me, one of my favorite stories about this, and I'd love to imagine this, is that, you know, in the 1890s when this opened, there's no school buses, there's very, very few cars, and so people would commute to this school on the train. Um, I think Marion's mother, right, who attended school here, 
came on the train every day, went home on the train. So you walk up Franklin Avenue from right, the train station down on the Village Green. So this obviously is incredibly important to the educational history of Millbrook, but I think as many of you know, it is also the reason why the village itself formally exists, right? By 1895, 96, when this is opening, Millbrook exists as a geographical designation, like people would use the term Millbrook to refer to where we are. Franklin Avenue existed, the houses there, the businesses existed, but it did not exist in a political sense, right? There was no separate government for Millbrook. It was just the town of Washington, and this was you know, the community within the town of Washington. And so in order to formally accept the gift of this building from the Thorne family, uh, because it was just paid for by uh, benefactors, donors, the village had to incorporate. And there was a, a formal vote that was taken in 1895. We have in the archives the advertisements from that vote. And the community voted to formally become the village of Millbrook and accept this building. And so it's important as a school, the history of education, but it is also pivotal to the development of, of this community. And maybe John can talk more about this or someone else can, but when the population was growing in the 1950s and early 1960s, a decision had to be made about what to do because the school population was coming too large for this building. And so I think in the early 1960s, I'm not sure the precise date, a vote was taken on whether to simply expand this building, basically kind of double the size of it, and create another like version of it over here, kind of on the Village Green, or build an entirely new high school. And the community decided to build an entirely new high school. And so this stopped being the high school at that point. The community was given the chance, but chose to, to kind of start from scratch. And so that's a brief overview. I don't know if anyone has questions for me about that, or we can turn it over to John or Henry or Marion, whoever wants to, to go first. I'll go first and get it over with. <laughs> Come right up. four generations of us grew up in Stanford. And as Robert was saying, there were a lot of one-room schools. I don't remember any of those. Uh, I went to school at the Stanfordville School that's now the Town Hall. You might know what the Town Hall is. And there were only 10 grades there. So back then there wasn't centralization. So we had the choice Ago, my mother and her sisters came here on the train from Stanfordville. But I was in more modern days, so we came in a little station wagon. And I don't know, it was just regular school. There were lots of choices of classes to take. I wanted to be a nurse. It didn't work out, but I wanted to be a nurse, so I took a lot of languages and science and math. And um, so I think languages are on the third floor. I think our home room was on the second floor, a big, a big room there. Um, math, I remember, geometry, intermediate algebra. I remember a funny story about that fire escape. We were having um, a 
Latin or one of the classes, and a little boy had run away from home. He lived right around the village. Walked right up and came right into our room. <laughs> just to see what was going on. Um, we didn't have a gym, so we had to walk down to the um, village, what's now the village hall. I think years ago it was called the Y, was it? Otherwise, we would have gym out there on nice days. Um, that's all. We had nice teachers. Miss Peard, Mr. Ross was the principal, um, Mrs. Rogers was the language teacher, Bill Gregory, was, I guess you, most, a lot of you know Bill Gregory, mm -hmm. um, he was a business teacher, I mean, remember Bill Gregory, um, after he was clerk of the school board, I got his job, clerk of the school board, for quite a long time. <laughs> Isn't much to tell. Marion, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but when your mother or maybe your sisters took the train here, did they sync up the train schedule with the school schedule, or did you just have to get here well, early and get the train whenever? It I guess because she knew. I probably had heard, and, you know, she was married and had me by the time, and she didn't talk about it. She didn't hmm. talk about it anymore. All I know is that they came by train. We lived in Stamfordville, so I don't remember that much about the train station here. I remember the one in Stamfordville, because we would have to walk by it, and there'd be like a big, big guy singing, and we stare, sit there, stay there and stare at him. But I didn't see the train station. You know, I remember seeing it later on, but not uh, Thank you, Mary. I'm not much of a public speaker, but I'll just tell you, oh, wait a minute, i got to get my notes. Nancy told me before I started, she says, you be sure to write, make notes so you know what you're talking about. So, so like Biden, right? Pardon? It's like Biden, right? He's got to have notes. Oh, oh yeah. Well, wait a minute. It's a very tiny piece of paper. Here. That's good. Uh, <coughs> well, let's see. Lunch. <laughs> Anyhow, we had cafeteria was down there. We had our lunch in the cafeteria. And after lunch, we had an hour for lunch then. And after lunch, right outside there, there was a ping pong table. The boys would all play ping pong. They had the tournaments. And the girls upstairs, they were up here in the auditorium and uh, played the 78s. Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby and all them old guys, and they were dancing the Lindy and the Rumba and all them, which we don't do. The waltzes, they, they hardly do today. And that's what they did at lunchtime. And then uh, every Friday afternoon, uh, at noon rather, from quarter after 11 till 12, 12 o'clock, we had what they call the, the club, different clubs. You could belong to the band, chorus, uh, or we even had a chef's club, which was way up on the third floor, which they taught homemaking up there, which was nice for all the young ladies to learn how to cook and sew. But the guys on Fridays could go up there and we would learn how to cook, which is a pretty darn nice thing. Uh, and then, <clears throat> and also, once a year, May, in May, they called it May Day, or we called it Play Day. And you played all different games all day long. <clears throat> and right up here where the band shelter is, they'd have a little platform there, and we had a May Queen and a May King. And they had the pole there, what the heck they call that, when they weave in and out with the streamers? 
Yeah, yeah. the pole ring. You know. yeah. The little kids would do that, and it was a big, it was a big day. Uh, May Day was a was a big day. Well, I, <clears throat> I kind of fooled around in school more than anything, and that was the joker more. And uh, down here was our shop. Charlie would know all about that. We had a great, great shop teacher. And back in my day. Yo-yos were a big thing, if you remember them things. <clears throat> and I was pretty good with it. So I was in there having shop. And Joe Far Joe, real good guy, he was working bending over, and he was working on a kid's thing, and I was impatient. I had my yo-yo going. And there was a thing with the yo-yo. You used to put it out there like that, and it would spin, and they call it the sleeper. You know what it is. You used to call it the sleeper. And I threw it out right over his head. It stood there and it's spinning like anything. He come up and yeah, the string got caught in his hair. You know, that was not good. It was kind of bad. I got in detention for that for quite a while. But, uh, the other thing we had uh, we had the play, the senior play, and that was usually a week or two. We would put it on before graduation, and uh, rehearsal was all was two or three nights a week, seven o'clock, right up there on the stage. And I still remember the name of our play was Pure as a Driven Snow. It had something to do with a farmer. And of course, I grew up on the Oakley Thorn Estate, and uh, I had some cows down there. But anyhow, they called me the farmer. But I was in that play. So anyhow, one night after, and at that time, Oakley Thorn gave me his Jeep to go back and forth because I took care of his dogs. His wife was raised East Norwich Terriers and uh, showed them down in Madison Square Garden. So I took care of those dogs. So we're taking care of those dogs to leave here at noontime to go down and let the dogs out. And that. So I had this, I had his Jeep. And it was pretty popular. Anyhow, after, after play rehearsal one night, I said to the girls, hey, you girls want to go for a Jeep ride? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I parked right out front by the steps. And I waited, Rudy Grozer, my one of my friends, he came out in Ralph Coover, he got in the Jeep, pretty soon the girls came, five of them, they came down, they piled in the back of the Jeep, and just then, we were all not that friendly with these guys from Dover. A car pulls up, and he, and he pulls right up to the Jeep, and he pulls right there, bumper to bumper, and he starts to give it a little gas, and he was going to push my little Jeep. Well, they, back those old Jeeps, they had a low range and four-wheel drive. And you just, so I pushed down on that and got in four-wheel drive. I gave it something. And back then, they, they had these fog lights was really popular back then. And the Jeep jumped right over his bumper and sure enough smashed those, those fog lights. I backed back off it and right across the street, a guy by the name of Seppi. I can't remember which Seppi it was. There was a lot of them in Norbrook. And he come running over. I saw that, Henry. I saw what happened. I saw them guys were trying to start something. So anyhow, we took off and went on over to Minion, got ice cream, and came back. We never heard anything about that. <laughs> now, the last thing I want to tell you, dance. The big thing was once a year was the junior prom. And I was only 16 then, and, I, and my father gave me his car, and I had a nice young lady. Picked her up and we were out there dancing this and that. And there was a guy Charlie would remember, Burkhardt. You remember him? He was the photographer of the of the village. And he was there taking pictures and everything. He said, "Come on out in the hallway, Henry. We want to get your picture." I said, "Okay." So me and the young lady, we sat there, stood there, and they're taking pictures. And all of a sudden, she screams, and me being ignorant, that young. She says, oh my God, my God, my hoop fell, my hoop fell, oh my God, she got all nervous. I said, what the devil is she talking about, her hoop fell? I didn't know what she was talking about. She said, Henry, get out of here. A couple of girls came around, they reached down, they picked this thing up, and last I see, she was heading for the ladies' room, and these little, these little straps and whatnot I was dingling down behind her, she went on down, down and back. Well, <clears throat> show you how time's passed. Of course, I got married and I had three boys and a girl. And I, I wanted that girl so bad, and that was my pride and joy, was my little Heidi. She grew up. Now she was going to the prom. But then, 
they didn't have a prom in here. Oh, no, they had to be in something fancy like what hotels or whatever it was, those big things. No, it was up at the Altamont Estate. That's where they had the proms back then. So my neighbor happened to take her, and when he came to pick her up, and I says, Kurt, I said, you take damn good care of my little girl. And I said, I'm going to be watching you, so just you remember it. Yeah, okay, okay. So away they go, and as soon as they left, I jumped in the car and drove right up to Sky Acres, got my airplane out of the hangar, jumped in the airplane, and up I went. Got right over there to Alton on, I started going around and around, and there they all were on the lawn down there. And Heidi says to Kurt, oh my God, my father's up there watching us. <laughs> well, he said he was going to watch us. And I said, well, there, she says, there he is, he's up there going around and around watching us. So that's all I'm going to tell you for today. <laughs> Fact to follow. My name is Charlie Colomello, and I graduated from this uh, institution in 1957, just barely graduated. Uh, living in Millbrook then was, was like being living on the set of Leave It to Beaver, one of those sitcom things. Uh, it was uh, the American dream. We had 21 kids in a class. Everybody knew everybody else. It was the melting pot. There were Irish kids, Italian kids, black kids, everything you wanted to, to, uh, to imagine. We all got along very well. We played sports. Uh, we went through, uh, all the way through high school, nobody ever talked about drugs or, or uh, things like that. It was just, a, a, like I said, right out of uh, Leave it to be. Uh, uh, it was a very, very wholesome uh, place to live. Everybody knew everybody. The doors were left open all night long in the summer. Uh, we played until dark, and then uh, our parents expected us home, and we were home. So it was, uh, uh, for me, it was it was a, a fantastic thing, and I just wish that my kids could have had the same kind of a, of a upbringing. Uh, maybe it's because it was the 50s, and we had just won a war, and uh, uh, things were looking great for the whole country. But it was, uh, it was a wonderful time to be alive and to grow up. And that's it. Thank you. My name is John Flanagan. I graduated in the last class from here, 1961. In the fall of 61, they were in the new Central School. And Bob was right, 1960, they had a big fight here in Millbrook. There was one faction did not want to spend a lot of money on a new school and progresses. My uncle was the president of the school board and they, there was a lot of animosity through this village of what to do. But if they added another building on here, they still had no athletic fields or anything. And they had an opportunity behind the Episcopal Church here to buy about 160 acres from the Morgan Wing Estate. And that's when that passed and they built that school over there. But let me tell you, in 1961, this building was still beautiful. You know, it had been maintained, it had been painted. There was no reason to get rid of it except they needed a new central school. And I played, uh, I was in this school 6th uh, grade, 7th grade, 8th, ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th. So I was here six years. And uh, I played four years of baseball, baseball and basketball. And when we went to like uh, Pauley, Dover, uh, Pine Plains, Armenia, their schools, they had not built central schools yet. And we were one of the first in the county. Uh, Weavatuck had started a, a central school, but we hadn't. But this thing was a beautiful building, functional building, and like Charlie said, you knew every room, you knew every person in here, and a lot of great memories here. I can tell you my junior prom, 
I was not a dancer. I was terrible. And they talked me into taking, I won't mention, because I thought she was going to be here tonight. <laughs> we went to the prom. I had on a robin's egg blue tuxedo. We stayed at the prom an hour, hour and a half. And we all went parking up in the waterworks here, necking and everything and drinking. And as they went to pull out, I fell out of the car I was riding with. <laughs> in mud and green grass, I wound up buying a new tuxedo for the company, and then we went to somebody's house, I forgot, here in the village, where again, it was basically just drinking and talking and everything, and my date threw up on her gown. I had to take her home. I, yeah, I got memories of my problem. <laughs> but, uh, no, this was... And I think that when they're done, it's going to be a great building again. So, John, can you tell the story about how when you were in elementary school, they brought you up here for oh, well, yeah. an assembly? Uh, when I was in the elementary school down the hill, every about once a month or every two or three weeks, they would have a special program up here on Friday. And it would be cartoons or a magician. It might be uh, movies, something special. Somebody singing, this and that. So they would march us kids. I would have been 10 or 11 at the time. They'd march us up here that this one Friday. And they let all the upper classes take the front seats. And then we sat in the aisles or in front of the stage. And we're all talking, you know, what do you think we're going to see today? A movie? Cartoon? Anybody know what we're going to see? And they go, shh, quiet, quiet. And this little woman walks out all frail and talking in a funny voice and we're going I, I was I said aren't there any cartoons and they said quiet or you're gonna be out little did we know we didn't know ourselves it was Eleanor Roosevelt <laughs> and she came up here to address the students and everything and of course we didn't know who she was but later on, when they explained it to us and gave us holy hell, you know. But uh, yeah, that was my Eleanor Roosevelt uh, story. So. All right, thank you. Anybody have questions or anything else that you want to share? Yeah, go ahead. So it was 7 through 12, and you said, somebody said like 20... 20, 25 kids per class. When I graduated in 61, we had 26 in my class. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the class behind me had 42, wow. and the class after me had 46. So, so why we had only 26, I don't know. Well, I, ours was known for the largest class ever here. There were 52. We graduated in 1943. That's another interesting thing. The war was, Pearl Harbor was 1941, and it was sad. Those that had to go off to war and those that never came back. But we had a big class, which was unusual for Millbrook. So, so doing some magic things like, like max, like 250 kids, 200, 250 kids? Well, we had four, we had four senior classes so. that maybe 30 each, 120. And then the two lower classes, 30, 40. Yeah, 200, 220. Okay. Of course, they centralized at some point there, and we started to get kids from, from other towns. Yeah, 62, 61, the fall of 61, the new high school opened. And that's when they centralized and everything. I think it's interesting that my father graduated from here in 1917, and my brother in 1954. But I'm too young. I never went to school here. <laughs> Where'd you go, Pine Plain? No, I went to mm -hmm. high the, new, the new high school, which oh. is now the middle school. Oh, I thought you lived around Stanford, though. Well, on 82. Mm -hmm. So our, our hope is that one day the Historical Society can have its archives in this building, and there'll be a, a museum about Millbrook history in this building. I don't know if that's going to be possible. We're trying to make it happen and having conversations about it. Um, 
Um, but I think that would be an incredibly fitting future for a building that has played such an important role in Millbrook's past. Um, there is a huge auditorium here for you people that have never been in there, and they plan to uh, do that completely, and there's a stage about five feet up, and they, they plan plays, uh, concerts, uh, movies. They've got a lot of plans for that uh, auditorium, the, uh, what do you call it there? I don't know what you call it. Reno what, where they're going to renovate the big room there. They gave it in detail last Thursday, I think, at the firehouse. Um, Oakley Thorn and George Whalen. I think the presentation's been put on the internet. Oh, yeah. On the, on the Thorn, what is it, thornbuilding.org, maybe? Oh, Does anybody know? Okay. But I did read that I I, they must have had like PowerPoint presentation that, that you can look at online. Is it the, what is, it's the Millbrook Community Partnership that yes. they're called now, yes. I guess? So I don't know that they actually have a website or if it's just under Millbrook or under it's Thorn it's Building. Thorn yeah. Building. Yeah. I couldn't find it. Uh, in the plans that they presented, is the Historical Society thing part of that or not? No. No. <laughs> there is no, no space. It's a very, what they're planning is to have a very fluid space inside. So even where they may have a gallery space, they're saying, well, you know, that would be a, a, an exhibit going up and, and down again. But a very fluid Wedding space. open space to use for everything. So we can use it, but we need archival space, <laughs> which we're growing out of our present space while we're very lucky to have any archival space at all, but we are growing out of it. It is, it is thornbuilding.org, and there is a link to the public meeting presentation from great. July 29th. Okay, great. So this is, I think, the fourth of six of these summer programs. I know a lot of you have gone to, to other ones. Then they're every two weeks, so the next one in two weeks is, I think, on Washington Avenue, the history of Washington Avenue, if you enjoyed John's stories today. He has more <laughs> stories about the history of Washington Avenue. So that is, what, the 21st of August? Does that sound right? Two weeks from, from today. So we